Okay, if I can have everybody's attention. Um, I'd like to welcome you all to, uh, to this year's Lawson Lecture. I'm Richard Allen. I'm the director of the Berkeley Seismo Lab. And so it's great to see um, a lot of faces um, from our Earthquake Research Affiliates program out there. So thank you for coming and participating. Um, before I introduce our speaker and our topic, I just want to uh, acknowledge Peggy Helwig and Jen Strauss, who sat outside, who've done a lot of the, most of the work to set this up. And so uh, thank you to Jen and Peggy for that. Okay, so we call this our Lawson Lecture. Obviously, it's named after Andrew Lawson, who chaired the study following the 1906 San Francisco earthquake, which really was the birth of, of what we think of as modern-day seismology. And I think the topic that we're going to hear about today has the potential to be just as groundbreaking in terms of what we need to think about as seismologists as, as that study, the topic of induced seismicity, human-induced um, seismicity. Um, and so... It's my great pleasure to have um, with us today Greg Anderson. Uh, Barroza. <laughs> Greg Anderson couldn't make it. <laughs> I'm sorry, Greg Barroza. Uh, that's an important distinction there. Greg, Greg Barroza is, uh, is the Lowell Professor um, of Earth Science at Stanford University. Um, and he has a, a long distinguished career in earthquake, uh, earthquake sources. Um, I, I, actually, let me sorry, step back. I've confused myself with my Greg Anderson comment. Let me step back. Sorry. So why is induced seismicity so important? I mean, many of you may have seen that just last week um, the USGS released a report about induced seismicity across the US and for the first time um, actually included the threat of induced seismicity in their earthquake hazard estimates. Of equal note was about two days before that study was released, I don't think it's a coincidence, the state government of Oklahoma for the first time acknowledged that there was a likely connection between oil and gas extraction in Oklahoma and the massive increase in seismicity. They used to have two or three magnitude three earthquakes per year, now they're having two or three per day, so it's a significant increase. In fact, they have more magnitude three earthquakes than California has. Um, today, so this is a this is a significant increase in seismicity. Obviously, has uh, serious uh, potential repercussions. So, to our speaker today, who is in fact Greg Barroza, um, Greg has spent his career looking at the earthquake source, looking at radiated energy, stress drop, looking at the earthquake, the rupture um, uh, propagating across um, fault planes, looking at earthquake probabilities, and more recently has turned his his uh, interest or included in his interests induced seismicity. He's set up the Center for Induced and Triggered Seismicity at Stanford University, uh, where he's doing a lot, of, spending a lot of time working on these problems. In addition to that, Greg is also the currently is the um, president of AGU Seismology Section. Um, he's the associate director of the Southern California Earthquake Center, and is also one of California's seismic safety com um, commissioners. So it's a great pleasure to have Greg here today. So please join me in uh, in welcoming. Thank you, Richard. All right, thank you, Richard. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here, of course. And uh, I'd like to thank the, the Berkeley Seismological Laboratory for the opportunity to speak to you today about a topic that uh, has been around for a long time, but which I've recently gotten interested in. Uh, I'm, this talk is going to be uh, on induced seismicity and the resurgent interest in it and why there's a resurgent interest. And uh, I'm not going to talk much at all about my own work, but I'm going to try and put this all in a, in a larger framework and talk about some of the factors we have to focus on to try to understand um, what controls the induced seismicity, what it implies for hazards, and how we can manage those hazards. So this lecture is named after uh, Professor Lawson. Here's a picture of him. Uh, I, uh, my work uh, intersected with his uh, legacy, that is the, the, the report on the 1906 earthquake that uh, he chaired. It's, a, it's an amazing two-volume document published by the Carnegie, well at the time, the Carnegie Institution of Washington. And they had the foresight to preserve all kinds of data that they didn't fully know and we probably still don't fully know how to use. And among those were seismograms. And uh, one of my grad students, Sok Kusong, used seismograms that were preserved in this, this uh, report that's now over 100 years old to come to a, a better understanding of what really happened in the largest uh, earthquake in uh, recorded history in Northern California. So uh, Lawson had tremendous foresight uh, to, 
to uh, chair that effort, and I, I just would urge you that when NSF requires you to, to archive your data, it's for a good cause. That's Greg Anderson asked me to say that. He's a program <laughs> manager at NSF. Okay, so we, we should start at the beginning, and that is what is an earthquake? And uh, seismologists, earthquake scientists in general, have kind of a peculiar definition uh, of an earthquake. So for us, it's not the shaking. Typically, when we say an earthquake, we, ref we refer to what, what would be the earthquake source. That is the sudden uh, slip across a fault that generates the seismic waves. Um, and we can illustrate this with the uh, uh, 1995 Kobe earthquake. This was a magnitude 6.9 earthquake uh, that happened in, the, uh, uh, in southwest Japan. It was a strike slip earthquake, just like the 1906 earthquake was. Uh, but it was uh, significantly smaller. Unfortunately, it ruptured right, part of its rupture went right under the city of Kobe, so it caused uh, tremendous damage and loss of lives, over 6,000 fatalities. Uh, so this is uh, one of the things they did on Awaji Island where the rupture actually came to the surface was they built a museum on top of the surface rupture. So what you're seeing here is uh, the fault scarp that they, they constructed a building around in order to preserve it and you, you can walk along this walkway and take a look at the fault scarp. It looks like it's mostly vertical offset, but it's actually mostly horizontal. It's just that the vertical offset is what you can see. And then in the, in the foreground, there's a cutaway view. You can see the juxtaposition of different kinds of material on the two sides of the fault. This is the fault scarp. That slip would have accumulated over a, a, a fraction of, or maybe a second or two. And it's that slip that generates the seismic waves that prop propagate away in all direction and that we perceive as shaking. So the seismologist definition is that an earthquake is a sudden fault slip that generates seismic waves. Now the, the more rational definition is the shaking of the earth that, that is caused uh, by, by that faulting and, and, and is manifests as seismic waves. Um, and I can illustrate that for the same earthquake with a video. Now, the nature of earthquakes is that they unfold very quickly. It's only a matter of seconds between the time when the, uh, at least if you're near where the earthquake begins, where the shaking first becomes perceptible to where it becomes violent and dangerous. And we'll see that in this video. This is from NHK television, public television in Japan. And it shows, uh, it shows uh, there's a guy sleeping here uh, in, in his laboratory. <laughs> and and so, it, and this is some sort of low-res security camera. So you'll, first you'll see, if you look closely, you'll see a weak shaking of the objects. That would be the P waves, the initial arrivals. The guy on the cot wakes up just within two seconds after the shaking begins. He wraps his head in a pillow, uh, fortunately, and a, a bookcase uh, comes down, almost hits him. That's just four seconds in. And, uh, and then it, the shaking continues. So I'm going to play that video for you now. So weak shaking, guy wakes up, puts his head in the pillow, down comes the book, bookcase. So this earthquake happened at 547 in the morning, magnitude 6.9, the, sh the strong shaking lasted something like uh, 10 seconds, and yet it, it at the time was the costi costliest natural disaster in the history of the planet. It's been superseded by the 2011 earthquake, and uh, as I mentioned, it, it uh, caused 6,000 plus fatalities. I'm going to play that again. Oops. I can hit. I like this video because it, it gives you a sense for just how quickly an earthquake unfolds and, and, and well illustrates the fact that you have to be ready before the earthquake happens or, or else you're not ready. Okay. So everyone else, that's an illustration of everyone else's definition. Uh, since I'm giving the talk, I'm going to stick to the seismologist definition, which means that other things that cause the, shake, the ground to shake, other than uh, that slip on faults like quarry blasts, nuclear explosions, bolides, whatever, um, I'm not going to uh, speak about them. So what I am going to talk about are induced earthquakes. Uh, and these are earthquakes that are induced through human activities. Uh, this map in, in the lower part of this slide is from a, a committee report from the uh, NRC on um, induced seismicity potential and energy tech technologies that was published in 2012. 
And this is just a, a, a partial and incomplete list of different areas around the world where induced earthquakes uh, have occurred. So uh, they're, they're best documented in the developed world, but they, they, they happen in, in the developing wor world as well. And they're probably a particular concern in the developing world because for a given sized earthquake, uh, the less earthquake resilient uh, communities are, are gonna suffer disproportionately. So, you know, the conventional wisdom is, is not to show equations in a public lecture like this, but I just can't resist. And knowing that this is Berkeley, uh, and you're one of the premier uh, institutions of higher learning in the world, I felt like I could do it. <laughs> um, let's see. Okay, so for, for induced earthquakes, we, we know from experience that there are faults all over the place. I mean, you look at a rock outcrop at, at various scales, you will find faults. But their activity, of course, depends on the, the state of stress. That is, whether or not a fault is slipping depends on its uh, state of stress, according to this equation here. So we have, on one side of the equation, we have the Greek letter tau. Other side, we have a, a collection of terms. So let's go through those, uh, you know, sort of descriptively and then a little more uh, quantitatively. So the left-hand side is the driving stress. This is the stress that makes the fault want to slip, what we call shear stress. It, it, it wants to accelerate the two sides of the fault relative to each other. On the other side is frictional resistance. So this is the, this is the, the, the uh, term or the, the set of terms that tries to prevent that from happening. It's friction. Friction is kind of a funny thing. It's, it's actually resisting the force, and it's only as strong as it needs to be to, to, uh, to keep the fault from slipping up till a point where this, the, the, the left-hand side gets so big that the right-hand side uh, sort of can't keep up. But the basic notion is that faults will stay stationary as long as the frictional resistance is capable of balancing the left-hand side of the equation, that is the driving stress. Okay, so what are the terms on the right-hand side? Well, there's a coefficient of friction. That is not exactly constant, but we're gonna assume it's constant to first order. We can uh, assume that it's constant. It doesn't vary with time. Typical value is around 0.6 to 0.8, depending on uh, material and, and the level of nor normal stress. The second term that's inside the parentheses, so it's a, it's a difference, this is the normal stress. So the shear stress is, the, is the, 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 the stress that wants to encourage the fault to slip. The normal stress acts perpendicular to the fault. So depending on the friction, and proportional to the friction, it will, it will resist that slip. So it's sometimes called the pinning stress or, or um, well, the normal or fault normal stress. So the bigger the fault normal stress, the, the larger driving stress you need to um, make the fault slip. And then this other term is gonna be really important. So notice that the, the normal stress, that Greek letter sigma, uh, subtracted from that is, a, is the poor fluid pressure. So this is the, the pressure of fluids in the, in the fault, sort of in the grains, uh, in the rock or, or gouge grains at depth. So the, the, the higher the pore fluid pressure, the easier, the less normal stress there is, and hence the less uh, shear stress or driving stress you need to make it work. So let's go through the different ways you can induce an earthquake. So we have this, this balance, and the way we, uh, we trigger an earthquake is to introduce an imbalance. So we make the left-hand term larger than the right-hand term uh, can be. So how do we do that? Well, one way is that we can remove material from uh, near a fault or above a fault and reduce the normal stress. So the, the, the simple example would be to remove material above a fault, whether it's fluids, anything that's making the material above the fault heavier, that will reduce the normal stress. And if you do it enough, then there, there should be enough driving stress to overcome what frictional force is left. So that's one way uh, that earthquakes can be induced. Another way, and this is probably the most important for most cases of induced earthquakes, is that we can increase the pore pressure by injecting pore fluids in the subsurface. So then P gets larger, the term in the parentheses gets smaller, and then the left-hand side can be bigger than the right-hand side, and you can get slipped. A third way, and this is a little more complicated, but you can actually increase the shear stress and it's indirectly through uh, um, a non-local effect by removing material. 
So that's, that's either poor elastic effects or in, in, say, a mine, if you remove material such that the force per unit area, which is the stress, goes up because there's less supporting material, that can trigger an earthquake too. And that's making the left-hand side of the equation bigger. So any of those uh, terms, by changing them, you can potentially trigger an earthquake. So let's look at some specific examples. I'll start with a, a deep uh, mine, and this is a deep gold mine in South Africa. Um, it, earthquakes there, although they're small, are extremely dangerous. They kill people because people are down where the earthquakes happen. And uh, here's an example on, on the right. This is a, 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 a surface of a fault at, in a mine that has slipped suddenly in an earthquake. Uh, on the left, this is a magnitude 1.9 earthquake with close to 10,000 aftershocks. So a little earthquake with thousands and thousands of aftershocks. We know about all those because the instruments are down there in the mine looking for uh, this sort of activity. But this earthquake was induced by mining operations. Here's another one and, and sort of a, yeah, sure. What was the slip on this fault, the arrow, how long was that? Yeah, so this, the, this, Maybe I shouldn't let you ask a question. Th this, this comes from a different earthquake. So this, this is a much bigger earthquake. This is, you can see there's an edge of a support there. I would guess this is about 10 centimeters, maybe a little more. And, and this, this, this is a separate earthquake. But they're both in the same uh, deep level gold mine. Okay, another example of mining induced earthquakes due to where it's gravitational unloading. This is from California. So near Lompoc, there is a diatomite quarry. This is the stuff you put in your pool filter uh, to filter out the algae or whatever. Um, and uh, there's a deposit of it that they basically bulldoze and, and uh, collect uh, from. So what they're doing, it's, it's shown here, they bulldoze the overburden. So it, it re relieves the, gravi the downward gravitational force. And at some point, that, that reduction in the, the pinning force is enough to allow the fault to slip. So here's a reverse fault, a small reverse fault formed in diatomite, of all things, a white uh, material that, um, uh, that, that manifested as a, as a pretty small earthquake, not a hazardous earthquake, it's just magnitude 2.6, but it illustrates the, the fact that you can induce earthquakes through this mechanism. And this, this quarry has uh, generated at least four similar earthquakes uh, like that. A more serious uh, effect is uh, reservoir-induced seismicity. So the most Probably the clearest and the most uh, famous example of reservoir-induced seismicity is from the, the Koine India earthquake. This is a magnitude 6.3 earthquake that occurred in 1967 in uh, east-central India. 167 fatalities, so this is uh, yeah, a, a big danger. Uh, there's ongoing seismicity, even now, that's linked to the fluctuating lake levels. So the people who have modeled, who have studied this uh, case in detail, think that it's a combination of gravitational loading from the fluctuating levels, and, and hence the weight of the, the water in the reservoir, and poor pressure increase in a fault that has been driven by the, the fact that there's a big lake uh, on top of part of it um, right now. So there's a, a big experiment that's being planned to drill uh, now into the source zone of some of these earthquakes to try and figure out, uh, to, to better understand how how these different effects uh, interact to induce the seismicity that's, that's ongoing. Groundwater withdrawal is a, is a recently uh, discovered uh, source of earthquakes. So there was an earthquake in Lorca, Spain. So this is on the Mediterranean coast of Spain. It was very shallow, unusually shallow, only a kilometer or so deep. Uh, killed nine people, caused a lot of damage uh, l very locally. And uh, so th it, was, it occurred along a known fault and there had been uh, groundwater uh, uh, removal uh, from uh, immediate, the basin immediately adjacent to that fault. It, it was seen with satellite uh, uh, interferometry, so it was seen uh, geodetically, and the, the sense of that subsidence would have removed, would, would have encouraged the fault to slip. So here's an example of, another example of uh, removing something uh, that, that, that eventually led to a Earthquake rupture. Not a big earthquake, magnitude 5.1, but it was deadly. Um, there are a, a number of examples where oil and gas reservoirs are, are or have been depleted, and the, the, the contraction of the, the rock that the material is taken from 
leads to the surrounding material being stressed and, and uh, eventually uh, hosting earthquakes. And you can predict, based on that, um, that reduction volume, the sense of slip and show that it's consistent with this effect. So we call this poroelastic stressing. It's, uh, it's an important effect. And uh, in Southern California, it has had uh, dramatic effects in the Wilmington oil field. So this is in Long Beach. Uh, for a long time, they were pumping oil out of this field. It was a very rich field. Uh, they were triggering occasional earthquakes, so a seismogram from one of these earthquakes, actually 3.3, is shown down here. Uh, but the subsidence, so the, 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 because the volume in the reservoir was dropping, uh, I don't know if you can read these contours, but it goes up to 29 feet uh, down, and it's right on the coast. So obviously that led to a lot of uh, trouble, a lot of flooding. Uh, they since uh, replaced the injected or the uh, extracted oil with water, and, and largely alleviated that subsidence problem. So as long as there was no net extraction of fluids, um, they were able to sort of uh, manage the problem. So those are, those are different ways in which earthquakes can be, be in, uh, induced. But the, the most important, uh, I think the, probably for, at least for the, the recent activity that's uh, garnered a lot of attention, it's really fluid injection that has uh, that is dominating the, the induced seismicity landscape. So we've talked about these pore pressure changes. That was the, the big P term uh, in that equation. Pore elastic changes, uh, gravitational loading. There are additional effects that, are, that can be important. So thermal stresses when cold uh, fluid is injected in a hot rock, as is done for uh, enhanced geothermal, that can cause uh, changes in volume in the rock and, and trigger earthquakes. And also less well understood, but potentially important are chemical uh, effects that lead to changes in strength. So uh, as far as we know, if you were to rank these as in order of increasing importance, the, the first few would be the most important. Certainly pore pressure changes are the ones we uh, probably are most concerned about in most cases. So what's the evidence for that? Well, the best evidence uh, comes from Colorado. So back in the 1960s, there were a series of earthquakes near Denver and uh, a place that do doesn't normally have many earthquakes. And it was noted by a consulting uh, geologist that there was a correlation of, those, of that earthquake activity with injection into a deep disposal well nearby. And this was, uh, was written up in a famous paper by Healy and others, uh, published in 1968. And there are a couple of key points, or a handful of key points to take away from that paper. One is that they were injecting a lot of fluid, and they were injecting it deep into the, what we call the basement. So these are the rocks, typically granitic, uh, that, that underlie all the uh, overlying uh, sediments. And they are the rocks that are most capable of hosting large uh, earthquakes, because they're very high rigidity, and hence you don't want to be triggering earthquakes in basement rocks, because big, big faults that might be there uh, can lead to big earthquakes. Uh, the stress that was being released was not induced by the, uh, the fluids, it was just liberated by the fluids. So there was some uh, pre-existing stress that was, being, um, that was being relieved and leading to the earthquakes. They migrated to up to 10 kilometers away from the injection point, so that's uh, important to know. Uh, the largest earthquake occurred well after, over a year after the injection was stopped. Cause just so just because uh, the injection stops doesn't mean you're out of the woods. And the earthquakes continued into the 1980s. Okay, so there's this very strong cor correlation between earthquake activity in this, in this place, and we have a mechanism that could explain it, but there's even better evidence that was uh, also uh, developed in Colorado, actually on the other side of Colorado, in a place called Rangeley, where the USGS, in uh, collaboration with an energy company, uh, actually manipulated the pressure in a well. They increased it, triggered earthquakes, that's the, this panel here, and then they, um, they allowed backflow to reduce the pressure and the earthquakes turned off. So, so now it's not just correlation, it's actually, there's a control knob uh, on the earthquake process. This really seals it that, that, the, uh, that it is poor pressure changes that are um, uh, causing the seismicity. So, a quote from that paper, the cessation of seismic activity within one day of the initiation of backflow in the experimental wells in May 1973 
establish the correlation between fluid pressure and earthquakes beyond a reasonable doubt. Okay, so it, it, it can work. All right, so I've abbreviated in, induced seismicity to be IS. So there's uh, uh, nearby in, in California, some people at LBL and uh, elsewhere are involved in studying this and sort of managing uh, this. Uh, there's geothermal power being generated in uh, the geysers geothermal field. Uh, so that's uh, north of San Francisco here where that arrow is, if you can see that. Um, this is, I think, one year worth of uh, seismicity. I can't read it on my screen. Yeah, one year worth of seismicity, 19,000 earthquakes. So it's very well monitored, so it, it can be uh, monitored down to a low magnitude threshold. But it's a, it's a very active uh, within the reservoir. On the right is an important uh, plot. It shows that the seismicity rate, which is shown, uh, let's see which one is seismicity. It's, uh, well, there's a couple of measures, but it's this increasing curve here. And the uh, water, no, that's the water injection. And, and this is, well, there are a couple of uh, measures of different sizes of earthquakes. Anyway, the important uh, thing to take from that is that the seismicity rate correlates with the injection rate. So it's not just that the earthquakes are being triggered, but there's a proportionality between that uh, injection rate and, and the rate of triggering. That same sort of uh, observation has made, been made recently by Brodsky and LaJoy in the Salton Sea geothermal field, uh, which is in southernmost California, more or less on the Mexican border. What, what they found was that the net extra extraction rate, so injected minus uh, produced fluids and seismicity rate correlated very strongly. So again, the rate uh, of injection and the rate of earthquakes is, uh, is related. So earthquakes have been a problem for uh, geothermal power production, particularly uh, lately in Switzerland. So this is a, this is a New York Times article that, that reported on the, the fact that an induced seismicity uh, project right under the city of Basel in uh, northwest Switzerland uh, closed down that, that, that effort. Uh, that was in 2009, I think it was, or no, 2006. And then uh, seven years later in 2013, on the other side of the country, the northwest side of the country near Austria, uh, they were giving a second go to geothermal power production and they triggered another earthquake. And the sequence of events is different, but the outcome is the same, and that is that the, the geothermal power project at St. Galan uh, was shut down. So this is important because the, the, for a number of reasons, uh, one is that the, the Swiss see uh, geothermal power production as uh, part of their energy future. They're, they're walking away from nuclear power, as a number of countries are. In the aftermath of the 2011 earthquake, geothermal was supposed to help make up for that, and yet earthquakes, again, are interfering with this uh, important or potentially important energy option. Okay. So now I want to uh, hone in on earthquakes in the central U.S., and in particular in Oklahoma and to some extent Kansas and Arkansas and Texas, surrounding uh, areas. So this is an updated figure from a science paper that Bill Ellsworth published in 2013. What it shows for this part, basically the central U.S., from the Rockies to the Mississippi, more or less, is that from 1970 to 2005 or so, there was a, a steady rate, a small rate of earthquakes, pretty constant. This is, uh, Richard was alluding to this being a couple of earthquakes per year in Oklahoma. This is a larger area, so there are more earthquakes. But the, but the rate is pretty much constant. And then it, uh, same area since 2005, 2006, it really takes off. And, and if you can continue this plot and it just gets uh, larger and larger. So the climate scientists have their hockey stick. We've got. Actually, we've got a, a more extreme hockey stick. You could almost, it's almost to the point where the hockey stick could be pointing the other direction, and this could, the vertical part could be the handle. So, um, as, uh, as Richard alluded to, the, the, the state of uh, Oklahoma recently, recently being last week, uh, uh, sort of admitted or, or uh, uh, stated that, that it looked like these probably weren't uh, natural. And we'll, but it's important to, uh, to document that because there are people who, who doubt that to this day. And part of the reason for doubting that is that there was a, a seismological effort that went across the country, the so-called transportable array. Uh, 
which allowed enhanced earthquake monitoring, but only for a, a short period of time, a couple of years, while these places like Oklahoma and Arkansas that typically don't have many seismic instruments in them suddenly had a whole bunch. And it just so happened this coincided more or less with the time when all these extra earthquakes were occurring. Now, we, we know that the, the larger earthquakes weren't uh, occurring because they would have recorded by what seismic instrumentation there is, but we can actually illustrate uh, quite clearly that it's not just a detection problem, and we can do that by dividing uh, it in the, the eastern U.S. into the sort of central part and the, the more eastern part, equal area, uh, 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 and both areas of low but not zero seismic uh, activity. The difference being that the western part is where the uh, sort of new unconventional energy resources are being developed. So what's shown here is for the eastern area, so there, this is a, a sort of a, a typical seismological plot. What's shown on the vertical axis on a logarithmic scale is the annual rate of earthquakes. So um, this would be uh, 10 uh, and 100. And what's shown on this axis for that, that whole large green area are, is the magnitude. So fortunately, the larger the magnitude gets, the fewer earthquakes you get. Typically, the slope of that is, we call it the B value, which is minus one, meaning for each magnitude unit increase, you get 10 times fewer earthquakes. And you can see for these different decades, that's what's shown, or different periods, that's what's shown with different um, colors, that the rate is pretty much the same. The annual rate of occurrence is the same. Down here at the low end, where back in the 30s till 1966, we didn't have good coverage. There are just events there that didn't make the catalog because we, we couldn't have, uh, we wouldn't have recorded them even if they had occurred, and they probably did. So, the, but the, the take home message from this is that in, the, in this part where the coverage, the instrumental coverage is comparable, we don't see any rate increase. Whereas in the western part where the sus suspected induced seismicity is, uh, it goes from uh, a low rate to a very, very high rate, over 100 times what had been the long-term background. So that's, that's uh, highly suspicious, and it, and it means, what this analysis means, and this is done by people at the USGS, is that, is that it's not an artifact of the catalog and having this enhanced monitoring going through. This is a real, it, it really is uh, an increase, and we have an obvious mechanism for it, but, but it's, there's some subtleties to, uh, uh, to that that I'll get into in just a bit. But anyway, so what's shown in green and blue here are, are the two curves, the cumulative number of earthquakes with time. You can see it's a very different story in the, in the west, where it, um, or the central U.S., where it, it, it sort of takes off. And this earlier time where it sort of took off, this, these were the earthquakes in uh, the Denver earthquakes that were triggered by um, injection of waste near Denver in the 1960s. So, um, Eight days ago, the Oklahoma uh, Geological Survey issued this um, press release. I think it's just a coincidence that this guy is Dick Andrews. And uh, he, uh, they, they said that it's unlikely to represent a naturally occurring process, so a, still a pretty, um, a pretty mild statement. And, uh, but made the tie between the energy industry, which is uh, quite important to the economy there, um, and the disposal, uh, and these earthquakes through the disposal of um, water associated with unconventional energy production. Okay, so the, this is a, a portrayal of how the U.S. Port, uh, uh, determines the uh, seismic hazard. So it's, it's, a, it's a probabilistic assessment since we can't predict uh, exactly when an earthquake uh, will occur. We can, but we know a lot about what faults are mo most active, how quickly they're moving, how frequently earthquakes recur. And uh, you can see in the, the circled area is Oklahoma. So the hazard there is lo certainly lower than it is in California, but it's not zero. So there, there is some earthquake history in Oklahoma, more of it now. <coughs> and uh, this has uh, this uh, increases the hazard, at least in the short term. So the, the, the hazard that's driving, the, that has driven the maps in the past is due to, in the west, it's due to tectonic deformation. In the east, we don't really understand. Uh, there are 
ideas, but, but um, no consensus on what's driving intraplate or within plate earthquakes, but they clearly happen, and that's why the hazard there is larger than it might otherwise be. <coughs> but these induced earthquakes are different because uh, they're being driven anthropogenically. And so the, 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 st the stress changes that are being induced are not long-lived and applied and held in the same way that tectonic stresses are. So it sort of challenges um, the, the practice of, of building these hazard maps. Okay, so let's get into the details in Oklahoma. So this, this is again, is a plot from the USGS. And what it shows is how the area where the, the s ongoing seismicity is, is above the background through a statistical test, how that's sort of grown like an amoeba, and how it's, um, it's basically followed the development of uh, unconventional um, oil and gas with a little bit of a lag, about a year of a lag. So that's, that's also telling. Um, <coughs> and there are uh, specific cases. So here, here is a case from Guy, Arkansas. So this is uh, farther to the east. It's a, a, an area of, uh, it's the so-called Guy Greenbrier uh, earthquake sequence. And in this case, through putting out extra seismic instrumentation, Horton uh, at Siri uh, uh, in uh, Memphis was able to show that these earthquakes, even though the injection wells were happening in a rock that was above the basement, a very permeable rock, because you want to inject into a permeable rock so it will take the fluid, um, that rock was in contact with the basement directly. And so if the fluid can find a pathway to go deeper, it will. In this case, it appears to have, and, and what, what's shown here, so this Ozark Aquifer, that's, um, that's the stuff they were, in, that's the rock they were injecting into. This Precambrian is what we call the basement. This is the, the, the strong, competent rock below. And you can see that most of these earthquakes thought to have been induced are um, occurring in the basement. And that's, that's dangerous because, at least potentially dangerous, because the basement, basement faults can ho host a larger earthquake. So you don't want to, so that's one thing you don't want to be doing. You don't want to be letting water get uh, into the basement. Uh, also worth noting is that there's more than one well here. And, and that's, and, and so there, there are tens of thousands of these disposal wells, injection wells. And, and in some areas, there are many of them. So even if there are induced earthquakes, it can be very difficult. It's a, it's a big challenge to disentangle which well might be responsible. Um, and you can imagine the uh, chaos that could lead to. So one of my uh, postdocs and I have been working on this Guy Greenbrier sequence in order to get a better uh, understanding of just how many earthquakes were occurring and, and try to understand the evolution of the relative number of large and small earthquakes with time. We use continuous seismic data from a single seismic station located near the sequence, and we were able to find in a, in a I think it was a 16-month time period, over 100 times more earthquakes than were in the catalog. So the fact that these stations are very far apart means that you, we don't get recordings of them, typic the smaller ones at, at many uh, stations, often not enough to locate them and to put, get them in the catalog. So 460,000, that's over 100 times more than are in the standard catalog. And we can, we're just starting to use this to explore uh, the mechanics of the, of the induced seismicity, suspected induced seismicity process in this case. So here's another example. This is now in Oklahoma, where the, so you don't pronounce that Prague, you pronounce it Prague. So these are the, the Prague uh, earthquakes. And there's, a, there's controversy here because there are multiple wells. There, there, and it was an earthquake sequence, so the, the first significant earthquake, so some people think the first significant earthquake was in, induced, and the second one was a sort of a cascading effect from that. And, and, and here again, there are multiple injection wells nearby. Uh, Azel, Texas is another uh, example. Oh, I meant to say that the, the, the larger of, the, of the, the faults, the larger of the earthquakes also involved the basement uh, rock. And the same, you know, the same story for Azel, Texas. We had rupture not just in the shallow faults, but also in the basement. Now, there are places like North Dakota where there's been a tremendous amount of injection and, and very few, if any, earthquakes. So there's, uh, this is the so-called uh, uh, Bakken Shale, I think it is. Anyway, it's, North Dakota is now one of the major oil producers in the U.S. 
I think second only to Texas in, um, in the lower 48, and yet Froelich and others uh, went searching for induced earthquakes. They found three possibilities over a, a multi-year time period, and they think that probably, well, there's a quote from him, uh, probably only one of the three earthquakes is induced or triggered. And these are tiny earthquakes. So basically nothing is happening here. The fluids aren't getting into the basement. So it's, it's, it's significant, you know, that's, that's, uh, that's important. So this is uh, uh, further evidence to support that. So this shows uh, truly gigantic volumes of uh, fluid being uh, injected through various activities in Oklahoma. And you probably can't read it, but it goes from 1997 through 2015. There's actually about a year time lag between uh, when we have data and the present. This shows the earthquake activity. This is the, the hockey stick. So you can see there's been a lot of injection, but not so many earthquakes. So something has changed in, uh, in, in practice. Um, multiple things have, but one important thing has uh, changed. So uh, this is uh, work by Walt, uh, Raul Walsh and uh, Mark Zoback in, in my department. And the, the three areas that they, they looked at in Oklahoma that had the most seismicity, which, what's shown here is uh, in, in the dark brown, this is the important one. This is uh, salt water disposal well injection. You have a question? SWD. Hmm? Salt water yep, yep, SWD is salt water disposal. EOR is enhanced oil recovery. And some of them, particularly the earlier ones, they, they just don't know. It's just registered with the state that there was uh, injection. Anyway. What you see is that the, the, these volumes have increased tremendously in these areas, and the earthquakes, with some lag, again, have increased as well. Here's an example from, uh, we're almost in Kansas now, and by the way, there are plenty of earthquakes in Kansas now, um, of a field where they've produced four million barrels of oil per year, and they've had to inject 400 million, 400 million barrels of water uh, uh, as part of that process. So this is a, an accounting of um, what part fracking is of that. So fracking, as it's called, is, is hydraulic stimulation of, of uh, tight formations in order to get the hydrocarbons out, in order to increase the permeability. When, uh, when a hydrofracture job is done, fluid in addition to the, the oil and gas, oil or gas, fluid flows back up the well, typically 10 to 30 percent of what's injected. So what's assumed here is the, the more liberal 30 percent. And that's, so this is, these are histograms for the d three different areas with the most earthquakes, Cherokee, Perry, and Jones. And uh, the, the frac, what's called flow back water, because it flows back out of the well, is shown with the green histograms. And yet, so it's, it's negligible just about everywhere. So it's not the hydrofracking that's causing the earthquakes. It's not even the water from the hydrofracture, the flowback water, that's responsible for these tremendous volumes. It's something else. It's, it is disposal of uh, wastewater. So this is uh, just some tidbits from uh, USGS. There are hundreds of thousands of hydrofracturing jobs done in the US. Only a handful of events. The biggest uh, earthquake so far that's known to have been triggered by fracking was a magnitude 4.4 earthquake in British Columbia that where they inject, where they did a hydrofracture, um, where they injected right into a fault. So no surprise, they uh, triggered uh, an earthquake. There are a whole lot of these deep, uh, uh, wastewater, dispo salt water disposal wells in the U.S., there's 30,000. Depends on how you count, because some are, are small volume, some are high. But a lot of these have very high uh, volumes, uh, million cubic meters or more. A uh, few of them have uh, seismicity. And the places where they are having seismicity are areas in, in Oklahoma, as we've seen, and also Kansas, which I haven't shown you. So what's going on? Well, there's actually another process by which old fields that are mostly water, remember that, that one case, there, there was 100 times the water injection as the oil recovery. Um, so in these so-called dewatering plays or dewatering operations, oil, an oil-water mixture, mostly water, is pumped out of a reservoir 
the oil is separated, and then you have this dirty water that you have to get rid of. And the easiest thing to do is to inject it, not where it came from, but yet deeper, because that, that Arbuckle formation is much more permeable. So you can just pour the water in the hole, it gets accepted. Uh, the problem is, with large volumes of that, the Arbuckle is right on top of the basement, and so you provide the conduit, the, the water and the, and, and the path for that water to get into the basement and uh, trigger the earthquake. So the press release from Oklahoma that came out, um, I, I think it was eight days ago, pointed to this process. It didn't call it this, but it's, it's basically this process as responsible for the vast majority of those, uh, those earthquakes. So you're, I'm sure you're interested in California. So we have, a, have had a lot of uh, oil and gas development as well. So these are uh, uh, energy fields in the Los Angeles area. This is uh, uh, a talk from a talk I saw last week that Al Hauksen at Caltech and his colleagues uh, undertook, looking at zooming in on the LA, the greater LA area to see areas that have been developed, it's color coded by time, versus earthquake activity. Now California is different because there are earthquakes happening all the time. And the, the questions they were asking is, well, you know, have, have earthquakes been, earthquake rates been enhanced in oil fields versus uh, non-oil fields? And basically the answer, as far as they can tell, is no. Uh, that that uh, based on the practice as it's been uh, done to this point, that, that induced earthquakes haven't been uh, from, from uh, oil and gas extraction in California have not been a problem. So if practice changes, that, that may change. Uh, but, but for now, the available evidence is that it hasn't been uh, much of a problem. So I, I, I mentioned, actually Richard mentioned this in the introduction. Um, usually when we talk about earthquake rates, we, we think long term. We develop this seismic hazard map which portrays the strength of shaking that will occur with a 2% chance over 50 years, so pretty unlikely, uh, as a function of position on the Earth. Now, when you're injecting fluids into the uh, subsurface, you change these, uh, you, you perturb these. It becomes not stationary, but very, very much non-stationary, very time dependent. And really, natural earthquakes have time dependences too. So when one earthquake occurs, it influences the probabilities of earthquakes around it. So, the, the seismological community was working towards time-dependent earthquake forecasting um, in, in hazard. And in fact, we were funded by the California Earthquake Authority uh, recently to, to prototype this sort of a, a system. It's now being driven by the need, nationally, by the need to uh, account for the hazard from induced earthquakes. So this just says what I've, I've, I've said. It's based on the rate of small magnitude earthquakes I don't know if you can see them, but there are a bunch of black polygons uh, on this map. Uh, what was done in the past was to take the areas of known induced seismicity and just get rid of them and, and not include them in the, in the rates that were used for the national map. It's gotten to the point where there's so much induced seismicity that that's not uh, a tenable uh, thing to do anymore. So, so they, uh, they, the USGS and partners in uh, industry and government and academia uh, met in, I think it was near Oklahoma City last November to come up with uh, a strategy. That strategy was, uh, at least the initial stages of that were released in an open file report that came out just last week that starts to look at, at hazard based on uh, not 50 year, but say 1% uh, in one year. So shorter uh, term uh, time horizon, which for some purposes is uh, is quite important and, and probably better portrays the real situation. So let me uh, end there and, and just put up some conclusions about induced earthquakes. I didn't m emphasize this, but it's interesting for someone like me because it's an opportunity to learn more about earthquakes in general. Uh, fracking is not the big issue, at least not in uh, Oklahoma. It's this, it's produced water from these dewatering operations. Obviously there's, there's a accumulating evidence that we really need to be careful about in either injecting directly into the basement uh, layers or into formations that are con hydraulically connected to that basement. Um, I didn't emphasize this either, but I, I showed for Guy, Arkansas, just how many more earthquakes we can see and how much, and presumably how much better we can understand the situation if we have better 
monitoring, and that includes not just during injection, but also before and after, for that matter, because there, there are lags built into the system. Um, there's evidence from California and elsewhere that some of the uh, effects of uh, induced seismicity can be mitigated by, by balancing the, the fluid injection. Um, there are complicated situations that are arising and will arise because there are multiple wells that, that are close enough that they could interact and uh, you, you can imagine uh, different entities pointing their fingers at each other as being the responsible uh, parties. And then finally, we need uh, the induced earthquakes has uh, added some impetus to efforts for, for developing new approaches to quantifying time-dependent seismic hazard. So I'll stop there and take questions. So with that B value line that kept rising up, you're missing events at the higher magnitudes. You didn't have anything yet above <coughs> magnitude six, but there should be more eventually. Is, is that inevitable? Do we have to fill that line? So that's to a very good question. So, so Roland is referring to, to these lines here. So th this is what we, we call a power law. So it's a straight line in log log uh, space. Magnitude is a logarithmic measure of earthquake size. And what you notice is up here, there's the cutoff around magnitude five or six in all of these plots, even the plots with a lot of earthquakes. Those are the earthquakes that don't happen very often. We do, and, and the question is, well, there are multiple questions. What's the slope of this? Can we extrapolate that slope to rarer and larger earthquakes? So far, there's no clear evidence that we can't. So the conservative thing uh, to do, unless, I, I would say the burden of proof is on those who would say we ought to truncate this distribution. Because there are big faults in the central US. There, there, there have been earthquakes as large as about magnitude seven in Oklahoma about a thousand years ago on the Mears Fault. Um, there may be other earthquakes in the past that we don't know about. Uh, it's a key question, and, and, and uh, you know, just how, how big the largest earthquake can be. For reasons I don't fully understand, the, the hazard uh, depends more on how the strength of shaking decays with distance from the fault than on just where that cutoff might be. Uh, but that's the sort of thing that the, the USGS and others are exploring in, in developing these shorter term hazard maps. Since we live near the geysers, which is right above Santa Rosa, I have a question about the wastewater under and in the geysers producing so many earthquakes on a regular basis every day. Um, and the studies that have come out recently showing that, in fact, um, there can be an earthquake 30 miles away that can occur from the wastewater going down to the basement and then affecting the fault line. And I wondered whether you had any sense of two things. One, was the Napa earthquake possibly affected by the wastewater-induced earthquakes in um, the geyser area or Santa Rosa area? Mm -hmm. And number two, could this affect the Green Valley fault and the Hayward fault connection, given that we are not that far away from Okay, so this. I always have trouble with these multiple questions. So I'm, pro I'm probably gonna forget, if I, if I forget one of your questions, yeah. just uh, chime in. So um, the, the geysers, the seismicity in the geysers has been on, going on for decades, since, since it first started being developed in the 1960s, late 1960s, I think it was. Um, and there are plenty of faults right close to the geysers, not in the, not in the geothermal field, but surrounding it, l lesser faults that one would expect to ha if the fluids are migrating out of the geysers, you would expect those earthquakes, those uh, faults to be lighting up, and they're not. Uh, so that's, that's one piece of information. Uh, there are geothermal fields that are being exploited, not just in the geysers, but in Southern California, and the, they're, they're big, bigger faults closer to those, and those faults don't seem to be responding. So it may be that, that, that it's not, you don't have that deep connection. I, I, would, I would be 
shocked. I, I, don't, I would not believe a connection between the Napa earthquake and, and the geysers. It's just it's too far away. There's too many things in between that would uh, give some warning. And, and Hayward Fault is farther away yet. So uh, not to say that the Hayward Fault is nothing to worry about because it's one of the most dangerous faults we have. I, I just don't think the induced earthquake problem is, um, is going to be what makes it go. So uh, following up on that, it seems like geothermal fields where you're pulling out a lot of fluid, that might be one reason why you couldn't lead to fluid getting farther from the field. But in <coughs> other areas of California where you are just doing this SWD injection of mm -hmm. fluid, um, San Joaquin Valley, for instance, yeah. do you think that there could be an in, uh, inducing of earthquakes on larger faults? Yeah, so that, that's a great question. Th there is... Uh, there is a paper that's not that's coming out in June, that it, that that systematically compares uh, well uh, uh, injection volumes and earthquake activity in Oklahoma with California. I, I couldn't show it because it's not published yet, um, and the the volumes in California are every bit as big as in Oklahoma, and just the places you're talking about, San Joaquin Valley. Uh, and yet, the, the induced earthquakes just aren't there. And, and so it's, it's probably the lack of a hydraulically conductive pathway to active uh, faults. And so, at least for now, the answer seems to be California is different. And, and, it, and, it, and that and the, the data, the, the results from North Dakota where nothing's going on, just like massive in, injection, just point out how heterogeneous the geology is and how important it is to understand things. And ideally, you'd understand them before you start injecting, right? So having a, having a strategy for siting injection wells that are well removed from faults, that are hydraulically isolated from potentially active faults would seem like an obvious thing to do. Is anybody collecting information on uh, damage to the built environment as a result of uh, induced seismicity? Well, there, there are lawsuits that are happening, but they, they, I, mean, I think they've been settled out of court. So I don't know. That's a, good, a very good question. Um, and there's relatively little data, uh, quantitative data on the strength of shaking in close to sm shallow, small earthquakes. It's it's a it should be a solvable problem because we know where they're happening, right? So we just have to we, we just have to have a program that puts out instruments and records the the, the ground motion on scale and 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 calibrates what what we call the ground motion prediction equation such that we can predict the damage and uh, you know quantify the hazard. So, but I, anyway, I, to answer the short answer is I, not that I'm aware. Right. Uh, you showed that during fracking, uh, there's a tremendous amount of fluid that did not come back. So there's a lot of fluid that just went into the underground, right? Yep. And um, a lot of people are worrying about whether fracking has something to do with wa groundwater contaminations. Well, if this water that is used in fracking which contains a lot of chemicals and uh, uh, sand. Okay, where do they go? They, it must go somewhere, right? Uh, well, it, yeah, so the, the idea w behind fracking is that it goes into the formation and stays there. So they, 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 they fracture the rock, they put in this material, sand grains or c ceramic beads called propent to try and keep those cracks open and the, the fluid in there. And the idea is that the, the oil and gas will come out. Idea, yeah, so, and, and they, you know, the last thing they, they want to do is to have one of these fractures go out of the, the producing formation because then the, it's a, another, it's a place where the things they're trying to get out could escape. Um, well, I mean, I'm sure, so, so, you know, we would like to be able to monitor where these fluids are going and uh, uh, I'm, I'm working with uh, someone in, in Zurich who actually gave a talk at Berkeley yesterday, Ann Oberman who has um, some preliminary indications that, that maybe we will be able to figure out, at least coarsely, where these fluids are going, if they're going preferentially in one direction or, or another. Um, but that's still, you know, it's, it's still the proof of concept stage. 
So I want to go back to this question of the larger earthquakes. Uh -huh. And uh, I'm wondering whether it's totally crazy to think in the following way. In m most te large tectonic earthquakes start rupturing quite deep, like 15, 20 kilometers, uh -huh. let's say. Um, does it make sense to think that, um, that you would have to reach, you know, the fluids would have to reach these depths to trigger the largest earthquakes? Or is that... I wouldn't bet my house on it. <laughs> 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 Not to put too fine a point on it, but, but okay, so there are some examples of large significant earthquakes that appear to have started at shallow depth. So the Landers earthquake, we don't have good control on the depth, but, but to the extent that we do, it, we think it started at around three or four kilometers depth, which is not so different from the depth of some of the, the deeper injection wells. So I, I wouldn't count on that, unfortunately. Oh, thank you.